this time on Earth Focus. A profile of Goldman Environmental Prize winner Kaisha Adahanova. Gary Stryker reports on wild horses. And the Studio of the Sea monitors the health of coral reefs in the South Pacific. Plus news about bottled water, World Environment Day, the Canadian seal harvest and more. All coming up on Earth Focus. They've been taken off the range and rounded up into government corrals like these outside Reno, Nevada. Their stallion-led herds now broken up into age groups that will decide their fate. These are uh, stud horses that are 11 years of age and older. They fall under the new legislation that Congress just passed this last year. Um, these horses cannot be adopted. They, um, they shall be sold. And what can happen to these horses if they're sold? Anybody can buy the horses for any purpose, including taking them out for slaughter. That's what wild horse advocates fear as a result of a new law passed by Congress last year. It authorizes federal authorities to sell wild horses and burros that are more than 10 years old or those unsuccessfully offered for adoption. The younger animals find a home, an adoption home, right away. The concern is what to do with the older animals. For 34 years, the U.S. Bureau of Land Management, the BLM, has protected and controlled wild horses and burros on public lands. The law calls them the last living symbols of the Old West. And under its adoption program, more than 200,000 of these animals have gone more to private all. owners. They're just wonderful, wonderful horses and friends. I became impassioned and formed a bond with this horse that will never go away. But a herd of wild horses on the range faces little danger from natural predators and can double in size every five years, competing for food with domestic livestock and wildlife. We want to make sure that we have viable, healthy herds and that there is vegetation from year to year for all the species that are out there because horses are not alone. There are livestock and there are wildlife, as well as wild horses and burros on the range. The BLM estimates about 37,000 wild horses and burros are now roaming public lands in 10 western states. And that, it says, is some 9,000 too many. In roundups every year, the BLM tries to reduce the numbers of wild horses on the range to what it calls appropriate levels, gathering thousands of them into holding areas. They are all ready for adoption. They've uh, had all their vaccinations. Um, they were removed off the rangelands uh, this last winter, and um, they're ready to go home with uh, any potential adopters. But many are too old and wild to be adoptable. The BLM says it now has more than 8,000 animals fitting that description, costing millions for food and care. That's the problem the new law was meant to solve allowing the BLM to sell older, unadoptable horses at negotiated prices. This will free up funds for the adoption program to, to do other things with. They won't have to spend all their funding on feeding these horses for the remainder of their lives. But it's a solution some say could allow these animals to be exploited for commercial purposes, including rendering into pet food or horse meat for markets in Europe and Japan. And they say the BLM is unnecessarily taking far too many wild horses off public lands because of pressure from the cattle industry. Wild horses are the scapegoats. We have between 32 and 36,000 wild horses on the range compared to 4 million cattle. So you can do the math. Under the new law, hundreds of wild horses have already been sold. Some of those animals were eventually sent for slaughter. And the BLM says it has now changed its terms of sale to prevent that from happening again. But critics claim the BLM's measures are inadequate and are calling for the law to be changed so that wild horses and burros will once again be protected from commercial exploitation. In Palomino Valley, Nevada, Gary Stryker for Earth Focus. Far away from Hollywood, or any sort of land on which to mount a tripod, the crew of the ship RV Heraclitus is making movies to help protect the world's coral reefs. Called the Studio of the Sea, 
The floating movie studio on board the Heraclitus features state-of-the-art underwater cameras and a video edit system installed in one of the ship's small cabins. The Heraclitus is an 84-foot scientific research vessel chartered by the Planetary Coral Reef Foundation with the mission to map, monitor, and preserve the world's coral reefs. The foundation estimates that over two-thirds of the world's coral reefs face destruction from climate change, pollution, overfishing, and other threats. Called the rainforests of the sea, coral reefs are the most biodiverse ecosystems on Earth. They generate $375 billion in annual economic output, protect the coastlines of 109 countries, and are the basis for 10% of the world's diet. Since 1995, the Heraclitus has sailed the world's oceans, its crew gathering scientific data and raw video footage of coral reefs in some of the world's most remote places. For the last two years, members of the ship's 12-person crew have worked on the Studio of the Sea project to create movies about their work. Well, the goal of Studio of the Sea is to document our travels and uh, to really be witness uh, of the state of the ocean right now uh, in all its aspects in uh, underwater, the states of reefs, but also the interaction between the reef and the cultures, um, and our own life, our own life as people living permanently on the sea. The films by the Studio of the Sea are part news report, part documentary, and part nature ballet. A recent film narrated by crew leader Orla Doherty documented their survey of the South Pacific Phoenix Islands in December 2004, where they made a shocking discovery. The Phoenix Islands lie at the heart of the Pacific Ocean, just below the equator and just east of the Dateline. Their coral reefs were studied in 2000 and 2002 by teams of scientists. They were heralded then as pristine coral reef ecosystems. In 2002, just as the scientists were completing their surveys here, global ocean monitoring efforts included the Phoenix Islands in an area of abnormally high water temperatures. Bleaching began as the scientists were leaving, but the hotspot continued for three months. Nobody has returned since to the islands to monitor how these reefs coped. We were the first to find the answer. They didn't cope at all. At Sydney Island, our first stop, we were surrounded by sharks on our dives, a good sign for the fish life. But the corals themselves were far from pristine. We know that they were almost perfect only two and a half years ago. So what happened? What we found here at Sydney proved to be the same at all the Phoenix reefs. A paradox of swarming fish, including all the top predators, sharks, snappers, turtles, but swimming against a backdrop of almost completely dead corals. How long can this situation last? Will the fish remain if the reef itself does not recover? And with so few corals left alive, does the reef stand a chance of recovering? The most telling sign of the devastation of the Phoenix reefs was inside the lagoon at Canton. What were fields of enormous table corals now stand as a graveyard for the beauty they used to be. Luckily, we found new colonies, starting what we hope to be a new cycle. But only if, and what if the temperature continue rising as they do? Will the reef adapt? We don't know. Only time will tell. But it's hard to see what the future may hold for the Phoenix Islands. These were some of the most pristine reefs two and a half years ago. Their destruction has been brought about long distance by something on a planetary scale rather than a local effect. Perhaps it's only through planetary effort that they will find their opportunity to revive. The Studio of the Sea film was shared with coral reef scientists around the world, including coral reef biologist Dr. Phil Dustin. When I first saw the video, I was just horror struck. I wanted to cry. 
I was upset because one of the most beautiful reefs in the world was dead. And the reason was simple. It was global warming that had caused it. And, um, and you get very emotional about that because it's a beautiful piece of nature and all of a sudden it's gone. And you know that that's the result of humanity and humanity's actions. Dustin, a partner in the Heraclitus Project who has worked on board the ship and is also a professor of biology at the College of Charleston in South Carolina, explains the scientific value of the studio's work. The Studio of the Seas video project is gathering information on the condition of reefs as you would see it. For example, we can go out with a transect and measure the corals, and we can produce a statistically valid assessment of that reef. But unless you have photographs, unless you have the visual, um, it doesn't seep into people's consciousness that this is an issue. What they're doing is collecting information in areas that normally are not visited by scientists. So my helping direct their sampling and helping them with putting together a program is actually gathering information that otherwise would not be seen, would not be made public, would not be open to the world. In 2006, the Heraclitus will continue its survey of the South Pacific with stops in New Zealand, Vanuatu, Santa Cruz, the Solomon Islands, and Papua New Guinea. The studio of the Sea Crew will continue to document the work and will focus more on distribution of their programs. The next step is really to have as many people as possible share these films with us, that they too can see them, um, that they can also live our expedition with us without actually going to sea, without actually getting wet, but that they too can come underwater, see the state of the reefs worldwide, see the state of the ocean worldwide, see the state of the fishing industry worldwide, really experience the demises that we're seeing and the beauty that we're seeing. It's a balance of both. And I think it's really important for people around the world to have that knowledge about the ocean, that they're not just land focused, that they see the whole planet. To find out more about the Studio of the Seas and the Planetary Coral Reef Foundation, go to www.pcrf.org. Maryland Natural Spring Water. I feel like a pitch man here. <laughs> At a press conference September 27th held on the banks of Maryland's Corsica River, Maryland Governor Robert Ehrlich announced the launch of a new brand of bottled water to help clean up the Chesapeake Bay. 95% of the proceeds from the sale of this water uh, will be used to support bay restoration projects. The money, estimated to be $180,000 in the first year and $400,000 a year afterwards, will fund the Chesapeake Bay Recovery Partnership, a new coalition of bay restoration organizations that includes Maryland's Department of Natural Resources. The partnership's goal is to spend nearly $20 million over five years to help restore baygrass acreage and oyster habitat and reduce sediment runoff and nutrient pollution. Maryland natural spring water is not water from Chesapeake Bay. It is bottled from a Maryland aquifer by the Brickhouse Spring in Ellicott City. The entrance of the state of Maryland into the bottled water market is part of a new trend of bottled water products offering environmental benefits. Starbucks Corporation made news in August with the launch of Ethos Water at its 5,000 stores nationwide. The Ethos marketing pitch is water for water, encouraging customers to pay a premium, $1.80 per bottle, to help fund projects to provide clean water to children and communities in developing countries. Over one billion people lack access to clean drinking water, according to the United Nations. Ethos Water was founded in 2002 and acquired by Starbucks in April. Starbucks has committed to fund Ethos clean water projects at a level of $10 million over five years, including five cents from each bottle sold. Americans spent over $9 billion on bottled water last year, so even a small niche market based on environmental values has the potential to capture millions in dollars in profits and project funding. Across the Atlantic Ocean in England, Baloo brand bottled water offers Britons a similar product to Ethos. The Baloo company has pledged to use all profits to fund clean water projects in England and developing countries and has already worked to improve water access and sanitation in a village in Tamil Nadu. Baloo has also taken its environmental standard one notch higher recently with the introduction of the Baloo Bio Bottle. The Bio Bottle is a biodegradable container made from NatureWorks brand PLA Plastic. 
PLA, or polylactic acid plastic, is made from cornstarch, not petroleum, and looks and functions just like traditional plastic, but it can be composted and is greenhouse gas neutral. Plastic made from corn has great appeal to marketers like the Baloo Company, but Baloo delayed introduction of the new bio bottle until this fall because of concerns about the use of genetically modified corn in the creation of PLA plastic at the NatureWorks plant owned by Cargill Dow in Blair, Nebraska. Cargill now offers packaging that is certified free of genetically modified grain at a slightly higher price, which Baloo pays to bring GM-free packaging to its customers. In September, restaurant chain Red Lobster was again the target for protesters trying to end the Canadian harp seal harvest. The Humane Society of the United States staged a demonstration in Orlando, Florida at the annual shareholders meeting of Darden Restaurants, the parent company of Red Lobster. Protesters hoped to persuade Darden to join a boycott of Canadian seafood products. Red Lobster is owned by a company called Darden and Darden is headquartered right here in Orlando. So we're asking Red Lobster to join with us to help save the seals. But to date, Red Lobster has refused to join our efforts. We believe that Red Lobster has the power to influence Canada's fishing industry and stop the hunt for goats. This year, an estimated 317,600 seals have been killed along Canada's east coast. In 2003, the Canadian government set a three-year total allowing for the slaughter of 975,000 seals. This volume of harvest is close to the high seal harvest levels of the 1950s and 60s that led to a serious decline in the harp seal population. Although the hunting of pure white coat harp seals was banned in 1987, today up to 95 percent of the hunted seals are less than 12 weeks old. Twelve days after birth, seal pups begin to molt their soft white fur to a silvery, spotted, more adult-like coat. This type of pelt is greatly desired in the European fashion market. To find leverage beyond the fashion industry, boycott organizers have targeted seafood products sourced from Newfoundland, the location of the seal harvest. According to the Humane Society, sealing accounts for only 2% of annual sales from Newfoundland's fishery while snow crabs make up more than 80 percent. The September protest in Orlando followed demonstrations in June at 94 North American Red Lobster restaurants. They're the biggest seafood chain in America. They have the economic clout to end the seal hunt once and for all. And if they'll boycott snow crab and Canadian seafood, we can make this happen. After the June protests, a Darden spokesperson told an industry newsletter the company preferred to negotiate with officials rather than join a boycott it said hurt innocent people. A statement on the Darden restaurant's website claims that Red Lobster is not involved in the seal hunt in any way, does not buy or sell seal products, nor does it buy any products at all from Newfoundland. Protesters from the Humane Society dispute this claim and believe that although Red Lobster may not be buying directly from Newfoundland, they continue to serve seafood that is sourced from Newfoundland. The Warani indigenous people of Ecuador recently elected new leaders who oppose the expansion of oil development and road building in Warani ancestral lands in the Ecuadorian Amazon. At an extraordinary assembly held at the Warani village of Teguino on August 29th, Warani voters elected Nankamo and Omenga president and Moy and Omenga vice president. The new Warani leaders are expected to step up pressure on the Ecuadorian government to impose a 10-year moratorium on oil development on Warani lands. Warani ancestral lands are located in the Ecuadorian Amazon, roughly between the Napo and Cururay rivers, a rainforest some call the most biodiverse in the world. The elections in late August followed protests in the Ecuadorian capital, Quito, in July. 150 Warani citizens marched to present Congress with a letter demanding the oil development moratorium and greater respect of the Warani right to self-determination and sovereignty of their ancestral lands. Marchers included outspoken oil development opponent and newly elected Warani Vice President Moy and Omenga.
por eso estamos aquí, sufrimos, ya conocemos la experiencia de los 50 años, entrar a nuestro país, beneficiaron solo de estados. The letter also called on Brazilian state oil company Petrobras to leave Warani territory and the Yasuni National Park. Petrobras has a lease with the Ecuadorian government to explore and drill for oil in Block 31, the most remote and undeveloped Warani land, a region the Warani letter says is their only remaining refuge. Already, construction of a new road that will facilitate the Petrobras development has reached the edge of Warani lands near the Tipitini River. Just before the Warani demonstration in Quito, the Ecuadorian environment minister halted road construction into Yasuni National Park pending further study of Petrobras's environmental license. To read the Warani letter and learn more, go to saveamericasforests.org. <laughs> The 18th annual United Nations World Environment Day was held in the United States for the first time. Convened this June in the city where the United Nations was founded 60 years ago, San Francisco, the five-day summit encouraged mayors from around the world to make their cities more green. Over 70 mayors signed the Green Cities Declaration, committing them to speed implementation of 21 agenda items crafted to sustain urban living. San Francisco Mayor Gavin Newsom hosted this year's World Environment Day Summit. And I'll tell you what makes me so proud as mayor is we're living together and we're advancing together and we're prospering together across every conceivable difference. It's a magical place, truly, San Francisco. So it seems appropriate that mayors from 70 plus cities from around the world have descended here to talk about our common humanity, talk about the things that bring us together. You know, the Bible talks about the fact that we're, one, we're many parts, but we're one body. And what affects one part affects another. And it's absolutely true as it relates to the environment. As host, Mayor Newsom led mayors and other conference participants on a tour of area environmental sites, including nearby Muir Woods, a redwood forest preserve, as well as the city's state-of-the-art recycling facility, where over two-thirds of all waste generated in San Francisco is recycled. The assembled mayors from five continents brought different perspectives to the summit about how best to sustain urban life. When we have got something good in the environment, we must sustain it. And when, if, if, if something has gone wrong, we must correct it and sustain that correction. I know it's very, very hard um, for people in general to realize how difficult um, a country like mine, Brazil, is, is still destroying its forests, its habitat. Um, we are a developing countries and we have huge problems, and, but we have also some solutions and I think the best solution is through education. If you don't educate your, your children, if you don't educate your people to, to learn and to enjoy uh, wildlife, to enjoy earth, to enjoy water, to enjoy this quality of life, and uh, nobody will, will ever protect anything. Between 1949 and 1989, the Soviet Union conducted over 450 nuclear weapons tests in eastern Kazakhstan. The tests unleashed deadly radiation equivalent to 100 Hiroshima bombs. A Cold War legacy of birth defects, illness and death affected more than 1.5 million people in the region. Today, cancer rates in the east are five times higher than elsewhere in Kazakhstan. Kaisha Atahanova, a biologist specializing in the genetic effects of nuclear radiation, has spent her professional life studying and battling this toxic legacy. In 1992, Atahanova founded the Karaganda Ecological Center in central Kazakhstan to help people to understand the conditions of their environment and ultimately to change them. In June 2001, Kazatomprom, the National Atomic Energy Company, quietly introduced legislation to allow nuclear waste to be imported commercially and disposed of in Kazakhstan. Atahanova led action to stop it. Proponents argued that $40 billion in potential revenue would help Kazakhstan deal with its own nuclear waste problems. Kazakhstan currently houses 237 million tons of radioactive waste at more than 500 locations that await safe disposal. Atahanova organized petitions, a letter-writing campaign, public hearings, and fax alerts 
while drawing support from Kazakh scientists and international NGOs. Her coalition helped advance the message that with an abundance of natural resources, Kazakhstan did not need to earn money accepting toxic waste or to put public health and a growing tourist economy at risk. Atahanova's campaign to expose the likely voting positions of parliament members in January 2003 pressured parliament to drop the legislation. In April of 2005, Kaisha Atahanova received the Goldman Environmental Prize. Earth Focus correspondent Miles Benson recently spoke with Atahanova to learn more about her work. What have been the consequences for human beings and their health of all of that nuclear waste concentrated in your country? We have now third generation, and this generation really more affected than first. It means uh, how we know about it. It was a result of uh, long-term effect and low-dose radiation. Uh, first of all, it was uh, effects for mother and fathers, and then the child um, was exposed. And it is normal now, see how, uh, when you can ask people, uh, why died your father, why died your mother? And what happens with people? A lot of people can tell you it's because they have cancer. It means it looks like my family. My mother and father and my sister died from cancer. And now my brother also have this, this hard time. Why did the government of Kazakhstan seek to import more nuclear waste? Государство, наше правительство рассматривало этот вариант как возможность зарабатывать хорошие деньги. И в стенах парламента эти вопросы решались закрыто, без открытого обсуждения. Это служило причиной, почему мы начали кампанию. Why not Kazakhstan? But why not use that country as a place to put the rest of the world's nuclear waste since uh, it's already been spoiled? Мы не хотим быть ядерной свалкой всего мира. Каждая страна, кто производит отходы, должна сама решать, где захоронять отходы. Они должны быть захороняться в своей стране. This problem is not confined to Kazakhstan. We have it in this country. We've had it in the Skull Valley in Utah. We have it in Nevada with Yucca Mountain. And the people of Las Vegas, therefore, have a lot in common with the people of, uh, of, of Kazakhstan. Um, what, what thought do you have about how this problem can be dealt with on a global basis? Я знаю, что с каждым годом все больше и больше законов, которые расширяют возможности для атомной энергетики и ядерного оружия. И это очень плохо. Если мы будем дальше так продолжать, то мы никогда не сможем обезопасить человечество от ядерной смерти, просто от смерти от радиации. И то, что в США сейчас больше, чем 100 атомных станций, это все равно, что сейчас у вас здесь больше, чем 100 атомных бомб. И это может в один миг просто остановить всю жизнь здесь в Америке. Никакие деньги, никакие законы, никакие дебаты политические не могут в этот момент помочь. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only US network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs. Programs which connect you to the world.